Okay, we are now recording. It is Tuesday, August 6th, and this is the regular meeting of the Valley Green Energy Working Group. And we're joined today by Paul Gromer and Marlena Patton from Mass Power Choice to discuss our um, next steps for Valley Green Energy. And I know we have review of the minutes, but we, as one of our first items, but we don't have them. So we're just gonna jump right into moving ahead with the education and outreach discussion. So Paul and Marlena, I'll hand it over to you. And Marlena, do you want to charge ahead with the materials? Um, sure. What I thought I might do is just kind of first provide an overview of um, kind of outreach at a high level, the, the major pieces we need to talk about, and then we can kind of dive into um, what's most urgent and, and the timeline there. Um, so big picture, we have um, a couple mailings coming up soon. The coming soon postcard will drop first, which is, as, a, as you may remember, just a heads up that the opt-out notice is coming a week later. So then a week later, the opt-out notice drops. When that happens, we enter what's called the opt-out period, which is the period between the mailing date of the opt-out notice and the opt-out deadline. And that opt-out deadline is the deadline by which people have to opt out if they don't wanna be automatically enrolled. They retain the right to opt out later in the future. This is just if they don't wanna be enrolled at all. In that opt-out deadline is when we need to do um, some outreach like information sessions. We also still have um, an obligation to promote those information sessions. I know an initial announcement went out, but in the Valley Green Energy Education and Outreach Plan, there was a commitment to doing an announcement to promote those uh, public information and outreach sessions too. So um, there's a few different things happening. So it's mailings and then uh, an announcement about the public information sessions and public information session then opt out deadline and then launch. So that's kind of, that's where we are. Um, the most urgent thing to talk about is the coming soon postcard that we have to hand off to your electricity supplier at the end of this week. So we need to have that content locked and approved, um, including the return addresses. So this postcard goes out as, an, as a municipal communication. So there's always a return address. Um, it also does mean that any undeliverable postcards, maybe people have moved since the utilities provided us with these addresses, will go back to the, your city and town offices. So somebody should just be prepared for that. Um, you don't need to send those back to us. You don't need to tell us about them unless it looks like you're getting thousands and thousands back, in which case maybe there's a problem with the mailing, but otherwise it's normal to have returns um, and they won't contain any account information. So you don't need to be concerned about that. So I think that's the first thing is the coming soon postcard. Um, and Stephanie, I don't know, did you have an opportunity to share that with everyone or would it be helpful for me to share my screen? What's, what's helpful? Um, you can share your screen, although, um... Uh, we were fine with it. Amherst is fine with it. And Ben, I think, already commented that they're fine with it. So unless, Tom, do you need us to share the screen? And No, I'm good. Okay. And did um, did everyone have a chance to look at their return address on that? Or, Tom, I can just write to you directly on that if that's not something you've seen yet. Um, I thought that we got... Susanna from our office to get you the right address, but I don't know that for sure. Um, were you on any of that correspondence, Stephanie or Marlena? No, okay. I don't think I was. Okay. All right, so I think that may be just the final piece then is the return address. 210 Main Street, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and we're for Boltwood Avenue. I think that's what you had for us, so. What I had for you guys? Yeah, for Boltwood Avenue. Um, and Amherst 01002 is ours. Okay. All right. Just switching folders here. <clears throat> Hi, 
I have to confess that I don't recall what was in the outreach plan that we sent to DPU. And so that would be interesting uh, refresher for those of us who have forgotten. Yep, so I actually put together a spreadsheet that I can send everybody that lists, that takes kind of the narrative outreach description that was in the outreach education plan and puts it into a list. So all the different things that we're committed to, it's in a list format. So I can send that to you guys via email. Um, once this is done, I just didn't wanna overwhelm you guys with details, uh, no, but that does helpful. exist. That'd be great. And I had the plan. I actually opened up the plan too. I have it opened up right now, but I was going to just, I can send it to everybody as well. So we'll have the, the plan and the list for people who have different learning styles. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. it'd be easier. Um, and, and just big picture Adele, while we're talking about it, it's really a commitment to scheduling public information sessions. Um, there is a specification that there's at least one in every senior center for each of the three communities. And there needs to be a general one, but I don't think we, it specifies that there has to be a general information session in each community. So there may be some options there, uh, which we could talk about in a minute to do like one big one for everybody and then special ones for seniors or like special ones for everybody. So we can talk about that in a minute, but there's the information session piece. And then the majority of it is really dedicated to how are you going to publicize the announcement about the program launch and those public information sessions. There's a big long list of like, we'll send it here, we'll send it there, we'll send it here, we'll send it there. Um, okay, great. So coming soon postcard sounds pretty much done except for just verification on the Pelham return address. I was gonna try and put it into a chat, but I don't see a chat in this Zoom. So I'll just email it to you. Okay, perfect. Um, the next thing, so, that's due to the supplier at the end of this week. At the end of next week, the opt-out notice is due to the supplier. Um, so the opt-out notice itself has been modified since the one that we originally submitted because since we originally submitted the opt-out notice to the DPU, they've developed a whole set of aggregation guidelines, which were just approved recently. So that changed um, the approach to the opt-out notice. So we have a new opt-out notice and Stephanie, I sent you an early draft that didn't, I don't think it had any of the prices or anything in. I do have now a draft that I can show you. I just did an Amherst one. And if once you guys are fine with it, we'll do it for Pelham and uh, Northampton as well, because customers in each community will get one specific to their community. Mm -hmm. um, so I can share that on the screen. They're detailed, but I can share that on the screen if you guys want to look at it. Um, if you'd like to do that now, yeah. or I I'd like to see what what's yeah. what people will see. Yeah, if you could, Marlena, that would be great. Yeah, Thank absolutely. Um, so let me just see, make sure I don't have that's the one. I have a lot of files open to potentially show you folks. I'm just making sure I'm opening the right one. Okay, can everybody see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So um <laughs> This is this is the new first page. Um, there's a more graphic focus to it than the previous one, which was you might remember just kind of a big wall of words as we were trying to keep up with all the different things that had to be shoved in. Um, with this approach, we've been able to actually make it, I think, a little more visually inviting. And there's also a QR code now, which will make it easier for people to get to the website as well. Um, so you can see that there's just very straightforward language um, about the price, customer support, and where to get more information in that blue box. Um, and then the, there's a very short three bullets about what participating means in the program. And we highlight the additional renewable energy because that's a priority for the program. And then we really try to use consumer friendly language throughout um, the automatic enrollment model we know makes people nervous. So we really try to focus on the reality that you're adding choices and people have control over the choice to participate or not participate in which option they choose. So these this graphic here, these uh, circles. It's the same graphic that's going to be on your Valley Green Energy website. So people will see this if they go to the website. Everything will look consistent and familiar. 
Um, so down at the bottom, we've got information on opting out, choosing an option, customer support, all of that bolded for everyone. Um, and then if I just scroll to the back, we do still have to include a table, but it's much simpler than the one that we had before. Previously, the DPU required us to have for every year of the contract, the renewable energy content for each program option. So it was this incredibly dense table with, for this, it would have had three columns under each program option, one for 24, one for 25, and one for 26 with the renewable energy content and the same thing for the utility. So um, this is much, much simpler table. It's still a lot to look at visually, but it's a lot better than it was thanks to these new guidelines. Um, and so what we've done here is you'll see there's a focus on the class one recs, and that's what is added up to be totaled in this table. And then separate from that, we call out the other cleaner renewable sources like the large hydro, the nuclear, all that other stuff that's in that extra 38, the non-class one component of the RPS, that's called out separately and not included in the total. And that does two things. One, it keeps the focus on the class ones. And two, it prevents that total from going up over 100% for any of those program options, which is what would happen if we included that, for example, in the 100% green total. Now, that is possible. It's possible to do it and to go up on over 100%. And some communities choose to do that. It confuses the public. It sort of seems to defy the laws of physics. Um, Doing it this way can also be confusing. It just is confusing because there's so many different types of renewables. But we kind of settled on this as a way to help LA Green Energy achieve its real goal, which is this focus on class ones and the additional class ones that you folks are adding um, and, and the real value of the program. And you'll see there's a little note under the table that addresses the other cleaner renewable sources. What are they? What does that mean? Um, people do call us if they have questions, and this is something we can talk to them about if people want to dive in more. Can um, I ask a, a question? Yeah. I, I don't know if this is, uh, if you're at a phase where you could edit this. So that's the first, like, is there any point in discussing wording? Potentially. Okay. So it, state law requires the electricity supplier, but it also requires the, in this case, Eversource, right? To make the same purchase if they're doing the basic service yes yeah so putting that that little asterisk where it says state law requires if you say something like valley green energy's electricity supplier and all <laughs> electricity suppliers including oh, yeah. source that's a great edit you know yep i think we could do that no problem because otherwise it, it feels like oh you're paying this dirty penalty <laughs> yeah you're right that's a great point this is language we are constantly wrestling with, as you might imagine, uh, because the DPU requires us to have the full complement of renewables on the notice. There's no getting around it. So we're just constantly wrestling with this. I think that's a great edit. Um, so yes. Um, Marlene, I can't really read the small print that much, but you were saying it lists the renewable sources. Um, yeah, I'll, read it out, yep, I'll read it out loud. Um, okay. It says state law requires Valley Green Energy's electricity supplier to purchase renewable energy certificates, RECs, from other sources, including sources that are not new, are renewable but not clean, such as waste to energy, or are clean but not renewable, such as nuclear. This purchase must be, purchased, must be made even if it means the total amount of RECs purchased from either clean or renewable sources exceeds 100% of the electricity used by Valley Green Energy participants. And this is, I mean, the communities, aggregation communities across the state are just grappling with, constantly grappling with how to explain this. Um, so if you just added, and, you know, Valley, state law requires all electricity suppliers to purchase. Including yes, I think that's the utility. great, yeah. So I, I'm not exactly sure how, the shortest way to phrase it, but... Well, you know. maybe we just remove Valley Green Energies and replace with all. Yeah. And it's simple. I like it. Yeah, that's a really good edit. Yep, I like it. Um, and then just moving on under additional information, you're gonna see um, some required text 
Mm -hmm. And you're also going to see things that um, we find are just really important for the customers to know. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see an acknowledgement about solar panels and participating in community solar and how that does not change how credits and incentive payments are calculated. I know that's an important thing um, for your communities. Um, so this is just kind of like our the stock text that we've developed now that meets DPU requirements and also heads off a lot of the early questions that come up if we don't include it. Um, one thing I'll call out is the question in at the top of the second column. I just wanna flag this for you folks. Um, so it says, if you've received this notice and also you've signed a contract with an electricity supplier, you may have signed your contract after the mailing list was created to continue receiving electricity from the supplier you chose and prevent any early termination fees, you have to opt out of Valley Green Energy. So the reality is the utilities give us a list mm -hmm. for this mailing, and then there's a period of time, and then the mailing goes out. And in that period of time, customers can make their own choice and sign electricity supply contracts. And the utilities don't come back and tell us, oh, don't mail to this customer because they have recently signed a contract. So there's no way for us or for your supplier to know that. If a customer is on the mailing list with for this program, they would get pulled out of a private contract and we don't want that to happen. It's a very small number of people, but just wanted to flag for you folks that this is on there. And if you know of anyone, because I know you folks tend to know the more savvy folks in the community who may be making these kinds of choices, if they made a recent choice, you would want them to opt out if they want to remain with their choice. If they get, it's only if they get a notice in the mail. If they don't get a notice in the mail, they're not eligible for automatic enrollment and they don't have to opt out. It's only if they get a notice in the mail. Um, so any other, any other questions about this? Who, uh, is that phone number two? Who would answer the phone? The customer support phone number is ours. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And Marlena on the solar panel. So then the, the net metering rate might change, but the net effect is the same. Is that, you know where I'm going with that? So in other the, words, yeah, go ahead. Participating in this program or making a change to your supply price is just not related to your net metering credit calculation. It's just completely independent. So it just literally has zero impact. That calculation may change separately, but it would not be changing because of participation in this program. Okay, I thought that the net metering was a function of the uh, commodity fluctuation. So it's, um, it's based on basic the basic service price, but it's not based on whether or not you have basic service or your personal supply price. Thank you. Your, your net metering, pro, at least in, uh, in this setup, just got better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, your credits will well, go further, actually, because if you're paying a lower price for your bill, your, your credits would be calculated at a higher price, potentially, and go further. Okay, well, that, yeah, okay. So, all right. I mean, it, I think it's, the way you've said it is the best. <laughs> uh, it seems like there's a little trimming around the edges, but not, not worthy of... Uh, uh, any more content, uh, any more text at, um, in this at this time for sure. I mean, Tom, you're bringing up the main problem, which is that people don't understand net metering and they don't understand right. how it's calculated. So telling them it's done the same way is like, well, yeah, but I don't actually know what it means now. Right, right. That's and, why I'm going with that. <laughs> um, so I think it's it's good for us and whoever we send out in these public information sessions to have an understanding that net metering is calculated based on the total cost of electricity per kilowatt hour, both supply and delivery using basic service for that utility. And therefore, if your cost, your actual cost is lower and you're getting a credit based on the whole thing, you're actually getting a better uh, total credit. Right. Yeah. 
I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> Keep it the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments about this notice? Can, can you can you see me? Yes. Hi, Darcy. <laughs> um, I just wondered, uh, first of all, can we get the this opt-out notice draft in the packet or could you send it to us um stephanie or marlena um and secondly do um when will the mass power choice website be updated with this information so that we can send people to it as far as like the updated pricing and so on and um you know i'm trying to figure out when to to publish all of this um, related stuff in a column, which I was going to do with Russ Vernon Jones. Um, and is it okay to share some of this in the column? So uh, a few questions there. Um, yep, you, we can actually absolutely send this draft out. Um, Stephanie, I can email it to you at the end of this meeting. Um, okay. And I'll just give you a reminder of when we need, when, when this needs to be finished. Um, the website is mostly finished. We're just waiting on some graphics from a graphic designer. Um, so we're hoping to have that done in the next few days is my hope. Um, and then you'll be able to send people to it. And with regard to sharing information, I mean, press releases have already gone out. So I don't think the prices are a secret now. The program launches into secret. So I think you're free to, free to share whatever information you like. The only thing I would caution is while it's good to have this opt-out notice and help people become familiar with it, you want to help people understand that it only applies to them if they got it in the mail. Because What happens is people get it, friends photocopy it, they download it from somewhere, and they're like, oh, this is me, this is applying to me. And either they opt out when they don't need to, or they just get very confused about their private supply contract and thinking they're getting fully pulled out of it. So you want to be very clear when you're communicating that the notice only applies to you if you get it in the mail. So if you have a private contract, the vast majority of folks, of those folks, would not be getting this notice and it would not apply to them. So just a very important detail mm -hmm. if you're going to be using the notice in communications. So uh, one of the forms of communications, obviously, is to try to reach those people who are not getting the notice so that they can opt in. Yes. Um, and, uh, it, you know, uh, so if if you have any advice, that would be great. You know, my thought is people get this opt out notice and then, you know, you one could start to recommend to them. If you know somebody who didn't get it, you should let them know. But here's here's how to provide a message about that to somebody who didn't get it. Yeah, just have them have them go to this website, learn more about it, absolutely. Um, the prices are gonna be front and center, which is always what people's first question is. So yeah. um, great point. Okay, so I will, Stephanie, I'll send you, like I said, I just created the Amherst version. I didn't create one for each community yet. Um, I wanted to have you folks see it and kind of bless it before I went to the effort to create the additional two, because it's just a little bit of work. Um, so I'll send that afterwards and we'll keep you guys posted on when the website's updated. We are feverishly working on it, uh, I assure you. And I know, I know you want it up there. Uh, so it's a priority for us. Um, I wanted to let you know that we also, as you're thinking about outreach, we've actually created two handouts for you, or one handout and one digital information sheet. And I can show those to you now. Those are actually ready. Our plan is to print the handout cards and ship them to each municipality. They're customized for Amherst, Northampton, Pelham. So we would ship those to you, which you could use for tabling events or whatever, however you needed hard copies of things, put them in municipal buildings. And then we have a two page eight and a half by 11 PDF that will be downloadable from the homepage of the website that you can email that's a little bit more detailed, not a lot, but a little bit more. Um, so if you want, I'm, I'd like to show those to you right now um, so that you can see what those look like. So 
Let me just make and, sure I know. While Marlena brings those up, I just wanted to let everybody know I had told Stephanie I need to drop off in a couple of minutes, but mm -hmm. Marlena will represent our side. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, oh, no, hold on. I got to make sure that the correct thing is up front. All righty. So this that you can hopefully see is a half page card. It'll be printed on cover stock. So not like copier paper, slightly heavier paper. paper. Um, this would be, again, you see the pricing circles you saw in the opt-out notice, plus the one for the utility for your community. So this is an Amherst one I'm just showing you, but the other two have been created and exist. Um, so this is the first page of it. And then the back of it shows how it impacts your bill. And this is all designed based on the extensive conversations we have with customers in the community tabling events for years now. These are the kinds of questions people ask. This is the information they're always looking for. So we have a bill diagram. We tell them what to look for. We tell them it's not a big, scary thing, that it's just impacting a few things. You can see where those things are. And then there's a whole bunch of things that don't change. Um, so this is one thing that's ready to go and we can ship those to you folks and I can use the addresses that are on those, um, coming soon postcards. Or if you want to tell me where to ship them, we can give you each like, I don't know, 300 to start. And then, uh, we can print more as you like, if that sounds okay for you guys. Mm -hmm. And just, it, this should be obvious, but the. Northampton one's going to have a, a national grid bill on the back. Yes, let me show you. Because uh, <clears throat> people here would think that's a gas bill. Yes, here's your national grid bill right here. Here's the Northampton one. So there's your Northampton seal there, national grid here, and national grid bill in the back. Um, so I guess we can maybe handle by email, um, where you guys want those shipped, but so that is, these are ready to go for you guys. So you have those. And then the other piece I was going to show you is this two page information sheet. We finished it about 20 minutes ago. So this is, mm -hmm. uh, very new. So this is not customized by community. It's going to be on the website. So it needs to apply to everybody. So it's got all three seals up at the top. Um, and it uses broader language, um, but you'll see it's got both utility prices on it. And again, it goes into the typical kinds of questions and concerns that people have when we're either talking to them on the phone or at a tabling event. So this is really reflecting years and years of our experience talking to people. Um, and we're really mostly trying to make this seem like a positive and non-scary thing and then answer questions. Unfortunately, there's no getting away from the amount of information that's required to understand yeah. aggregation. <laughs> um, but you'll see both utility bills are on here. They're little. So we have little call out boxes to kind of highlight what to look for on mm -hmm. your bill. Um, yeah. And then a whole will not change thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is also ready to go, and I can send it as an email uh, by email. It's a digital sheet, and you guys can start using that also. On the screen right now, it says have national grids yeah. basic service. So that's um, not relevant. Oh gosh, you're right. That's a typo. Well, obviously we need to we need to change that. Thank you. As I said, this was just finished about 20 minutes before. Good catch. <laughs> okay. Good catch. Okay, so we'll fix that and send it to you. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, and then I think we talked about the website. I think the, the, the last two things to really talk about are the public information sessions and needing to announce them. So as I said, I, I'll send you guys the list of what was committed to for how you're gonna publicize everything in that outreach and education plan. Um, but we'll need to get those scheduled. The sweet spot we found for scheduling those is two and a half to three weeks after the mailing date. And the reason is because 
sometimes the post office is surprisingly slow. We had recently a community that scheduled a public information session, I think a week or seven days after their mailing date. And most of the notices still hadn't landed by the time that public information session happened. So then the community's back on its heels and people are criticizing them saying, you know, you had a public information session before anybody even knew what it was about. Getting the notice in the mail is the thing that drives people to a public information session. So the sweet spot, like I said, is roughly that like two and a half to three week window, not, not before that, just because of the mail. Um, so that's something I think you folks will want to start thinking about really soon um, because you're going to need to put it in the announcement that you, you put out and, and we'll want to get that up on the website too. Mm -hmm. um, with this coming soon postcard going out, the sooner we can tell people there'll be venues for them to ask questions, the better as well. Do you have a potential timeline? I mean, I know we had a draft one a while ago, but are we sticking with the dates? I think those have changed already. So the mailing date, you mean like just mailing date for the postcard? Yeah. yeah so the postcard Never. mailing date is the 23rd of August. Okay. The opt-out notice mailing date is August 30th. And the opt-out deadline is October 2nd. Okay, so we would have to have our information session obviously in September. Yes. Yep. So, okay. Did you that. say the opt-out deadline was the end of October? October 2nd. October 2nd, thank you. Correct, okay. yep. Okay, so we wanna schedule our info sessions in September. Probably yeah. like the second week of September or so, second, third. Second or, thir or third, yeah, because if the mailing's going out on August 30th and the mail decides, if they decide to move slowly again, you don't wanna have, you don't wanna have that public information session and have low attendance because people didn't get the opt-out notice and they didn't realize it was applying to them. Okay, and we did talk, I mean, we talked about having like one big one by Zoom where all three communities mm -hmm. can participate. Mm -hmm. Zoom seems the easiest. And if it sort of covers that, you know, requirement for one big session, um, yeah. you know, I think that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Like we did initially when we were, when we brought the three executives on board and had that information session. So we want to do something similar. Yep. And I'm just looking at the um, outreach and education plan right now. So, and Paul and I talked about this wording earlier. If you read the outreach and education plan, it says the communities will host at least two public education sessions in each city or town that are available to gener the general public. But if it's via Zoom, I think you could argue it is in each city or town and generally available. So I think you can do one general one, but it does also say at least one public education session in each council on aging or senior center. So I think there will need to be three of those. Yep. Right. Yeah, I think that's, we should anyway. So that means one by Zoom that's public for all three communities and then three separate ones for the three communities in the senior centers. Correct, three in-person events. Thank yep. you. And we are anticipating, Paul and I are anticipating that we will be coming out to assist with those presentations. Um, typically we have, we have a slide deck that we would customize for you folks. And um, it's about a 20 minute slide deck. Uh, and then the rest of it is just however many questions and answers people have. Mm -hmm. um, but we just do ask that some representative from the municipality be there because the public doesn't early in early days, some communities tried to farm the whole thing off to us and the public didn't react very well to right. feeling like the municipality wasn't engaged. Well, I'll definitely be there for Amherst. Yeah. So. And sure. I've, I've been asked to do additional sessions like so like here we've got a retirement community the Lathrop communities and they've asked me to come and speak to them so which I'm just going to do if you 
were willing to share with me your slide deck or some version of it, um, then that would be useful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But yeah, I, I, I think we're going to probably end up doing a bunch of smaller sessions as well, just just as as we find audiences. Which is terrific. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. I think if we are asked where we might offer, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about other um, like family outreach of Amherst, which provides services to community members. So I feel like, you know, somewhere like that, I'd like to maybe try to coordinate with them and get some information out. I think more is better. Um, these programs are complicated. There's an automatic enrollment component. People get nervous. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I love the more, the more is better approach. I firmly believe in it. So I think that sounds great. This is what we've been discussing today is just kind of the minimum bar that you have to do to, to meet the commitment. Um, right. One additional thing I'll add is that we'll need to do annual reporting to the DPU on um, outreach efforts. And so we'll have to include a narrative of, of and we have to do this every year. For mm -hmm. you guys now, it's gonna be the launch for 2024. So um, we'll need to include a description, like if you could just document what you're doing and get it to me, it's much easier to do it as you, as, as it's happening than mm -hmm. like a year later when we're trying to put this report together mm -hmm. to try to go back and put it all, put it all together. If you have a standard table that is like if that's how you you tend to include it in the document is like a table of like events um and you wanted to share that we could fill in our own uh yeah that's it's a good point page. so that the annual reports have all been changed as a result of the guidelines too which just came out so um there is a table that i saw but i think the part where this outreach would go is just like one big open cell. And then you just kind of like got to write your whole okay. thing. So we're still, I'm still actually going back and forth with Paul a lot right now. Cause we're trying to, we got to get together the annual reports for 2023 mm -hmm. based on this. And I'm still trying to figure out like, what is the level of detail? How do we use this table? So I wish I had that for you very, very, very much. Not yet. Well, if you do, you know, and you just wanted to share it as like a Google doc or something, then you know, rather than having us record our own thing and then send you our version that we recorded in some format and then you copying it over by hand or whatever into your format, if you happen to have a format, we can just dump it in. Yes, if if we can develop that, I will send that. But unfortunately, we don't we don't have sure. it yet because it's all still too new. But yeah, yeah. it's a good idea. Marlena, so I know that, you know, Ardell and Darcy and Andra um, are working with their advocacy group and I know that they're anxious to do some sessions too are they going to need to be reporting out to you as well right because my understanding is any anything that we do needs to get submitted to you any information that we're giving to people scheduling all of that needs to go to you right so officially it's any official municipal communication efforts are what we report to the DPU and that have to follow all the DPU rules. Okay. Ideally, everything would follow the same communications standards, um, just because from the public's perspective, it's confusing if one person's saying one thing and somebody else is saying something different. Um, but if you're working within a community advocacy group that's not an official municipal committee, you actually do have a little more... Mm -hmm. uh, a little more freedom. Um, so you don't actually have to document everything you're doing and send it in. The DPU is concerned with official municipal communications. So well, well, I would just say that um, on behalf of the outreach group that I'm a part of, we would provide you with the, that information. I think that sounds great. And this new the new thinking they're doing around these guidelines and the annual reports, what they've done from a big picture is they've given communities more freedom to control and evolve their programs. And they said in exchange for that, they want more transparency around a lot of things. And a big one is around communications. How does how can the public find information? How did the public find information? Did the community make a love their level best effort to to be transparent about everything. So 
the reality is the more that we can say, the better it looks. Yeah. So that would be great, Adele. But just so you guys know, the obligation formally resides with the municipalities. I mean, it would be great to coordinate with each of us. If you're doing stuff in each of the communities, it would be best to coordinate with us so that we're not sort of working at cross purposes. You know, we all have the same goal, but I think for consistency too, I'm really, I mean, especially with this effort, I really feel like our three communities really need to be like right on board with the same messaging, the same information, you know, um, just for consistency's sake, it'll just make it easier. Cause I think it's already gonna be confusing with, you know, especially for Northampton customers, you know, having a separate utility from Pelham and Amherst. So, absolutely. Pelham and Amherst having separate from Northampton. Yeah, and a separate, and, right, and, and vice versa. I mean, uh, you know, just for example, I'm gonna be on the radio tomorrow and I'm, we're gonna discuss this. And so I'll share the information it's radio, which means that people in Amherst can hear it, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, obviously I'll try to be accurate. Um, you know, yeah. the, the, one, the one main difference when you're talking to like two utilities, customers with two utilities, because we have some communities that are served by two utilities. So we've, we've done yeah. this before. The one main difference is budget billing. Everything else is really the same. I mean, obviously where it shows up on the bill is a different thing, but otherwise everything else is the same except budget billing. So that's that's always the thing to know that you can you can say a message and it's gonna apply to all the both utilities the same as long as you're not talking about budget billing. Budget billing for national grid continues to apply for both the delivery and the supply charges when you have a third party supplier. For Eversource, it's not that way. For Eversource, which it's called budget billing under national grid. It's called the budget plan for ever source. It's called budget billing for ever source. When you have a third party supplier, you're in an aggregation, the budget billing no longer applies to your supply charge, but it continues oh. to apply to your delivery charge. Okay. So your bill will start to vary a little bit each month because that supply charge will start to vary. So people who want budget billing for that's really important. They mm -hmm. need to opt out of the program if they're ever source customers but not if they're national grid customers. But otherwise, all the rest of the messaging, aside from what the bill looks like, is the same. Okay, that's really important. Thank you. <laughs> that makes it very complicated, but um, important. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if our, uh, do we need to be able to explain how our budget option compares to Eversource budget billing? No, that's completely different. So your budget option is just your cheapest option in the program. Budget billing is when your utility looks at your electricity use over six months or a year, and they make an estimate of your use. And instead of charging you, billing you each month based on your use, they bill you the same amount every month based on that estimate. And then they true it up typically annually. Mm -hmm. um, so it means you, your, bill, your bill doesn't vary every month. It's 100% predictable for the next year. My bill is always going to be this. And then they chew it up once a year. And if you overpaid, you have a bill credit. And if you underpaid, then they, they bill you the extra. That's what budget billing is. It's not the same as the cheapest option in the program. But which is cheaper? Budget billing, whatever you pay there will depend on how much electricity you use. It depends on your average your average electricity bill. They look across your, your bills for the past 12 months and they say, oh, well, this month she paid this and this month she paid that. So let's average it all together and predict that for the next year, she's going to, on average, her bill is going to be $300 a month. So we're just going to charge her $300 a month every month. And then at the end of that, we'll see what it is. We'll see what so, that's sounds like it's not a discount. It just no, stable. It's not a discount. No, it's it's not a discount. No, budget it helps you budget, right? Yeah. It helps you think about your budget exactly. because you've got a constant number. That's where the budget comes in. That's where the budget comes in. It, it allows you to create a budget because your bill is predictable. But you're correct, Darcy. It's not a discount, and it's something anybody can choose to do. It's not a means-tested thing like a low-income discount. It's not that. It's just a choice anybody can make. I don't want my bill to change every month. I want to know every month that it's going to be $300 a month or whatever the utility gives me. 
So that then you can choose this budget billing option. So for some people, this is really important because it makes their billing 100% predictable. Not cheaper necessarily, just predictable. Right, and but it would be 100% predictable with basic service. Because you don't know how much you're going to use every month, right? Well, you, you use it might get really hot some summer and you're using more electricity and all of a sudden you're shocked by you don't have that much in oh, your I bank account. Right? This right. is like, exactly. I know how much is in my bank account and like clockwork, I can pay out my bill. Yep. Yep. But so, right, so that big high summer price spike or, or summer bill for your running your air conditioning, that never happens to you. You always, you're going to, that's going to be evened out. You're going to pay this maybe a little more some other month in order to pay the same amount every month. Is it, are people, um, is this something the utility calculates with the customer on an annual basis? So that at some point, like what happens at some point if they're having to pay the difference? So right? they, they do true it up typically annually. Um, whose website? I think I was on Ever. Can't remember if it was EverSource or National Grid's website, but I know whichever utility I was on recently, they true it up annually, and they give you a choice. If you've underpaid and you owe them some money, you can either like pay it in one big bill, or you can spread that out over the next twelve months mm -hmm. um, and have that worked into your, your <clears throat> for the next twelve months. Or if you've underpaid, or you're, sorry, if you've overpaid and you use less than they predicted then they give you a bill credit. And they adjust that um, over the course of the year. So it carries over year to year. Like they estimated on what your previous years. Yes, they estimated based on historical use, correct. Yeah. Okay. So none of this discussion pertains to the discount program. No. Correct. The low this is not a, correct. This is not a discount. This is just so, a way to make your bill predictable. The low income discount is means tested discount. Right. And that's totally not impacted. Also, fuel assistance, totally not impacted. And those statements are on the materials. Thank you. Okay. So um, the outreach group that has been <laughs> meeting has come up with some questions. And I just wanna make sure that we save time to ask those questions. Sure, well, I think from my part, um, it sounds like we're good with the postcard. I'll send the draft opt-out notice um, so you folks can get it by email and take a look at it. Um, and I'll change that text in the note under the table, Ben, that you you noted before I send it over to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll make a correction on the eight and a half by 11 digital handout. We'll get that sent over to you guys too. Um, I just need the verification of the Pelham return address and then where you want us to send the hard copies of those cards. Um, so that's- I sent you that. End. Okay, great. I, I sent, I sent, yep. Okay, great. Um, and then you folks, I'll also send you guys the list of outreach efforts that are listed in the education outreach plan, and you guys can get to work on scheduling your information sessions. Marlena, you can send the hard copies of the cards to the, the town hall address, um, but uh, to my attention. Okay. Um, same, same here, town hall address my attention. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Tom? And uh, it'll be under Susanna's attention. Okay, and um, let me just check. You said you sent me. Uh, yeah. So Susanna Carey. Correct. And if you're, are did you say you want to attend this uh, senior presentations? That was our expectation. Oh, that's great. Um, I'll just I'll send you a separate note, but I'll footnote here that um, the Pelham uh, Council on Aging meets on the second Tuesday, which is a little bit out of sync because I think that'll be like nine eleven. Uh, so it'll be a little bit out of sync from the timing of the postcard, but not terribly. Um, so I'll well, send so you. I'll, I'll, I'll. Yeah. So they go out on the thirtieth. The notice is. So the postcard is less important. The notices go on the 30th and that's the thing that drives people to these information sessions. So uh -huh. it'll have like less than two weeks to land. So if we're lucky it'll land, but that's that's the, the challenge. 
I will email the chair and uh, maybe we can get a notice on the, on her, you know, communication so that they have advanced notice that it's coming out um, separate from the, the mailer. Okay, good. I, that's, I'll do that. And I'll reach out um, to find out when we can schedule that. But I, I would actually like, I think it would be great to have you and or Paul present. I, I think um, your experience with the program, I think there may be questions that would be really helpful to have you all there. So we'll plan on, you know, we'll let you know. My experience is we get tough questions at senior center events because those folks aren't, aren't, uh, they're they're very well educated typically they do a lot of reading <laughs> so they they typically ask some pretty hard questions so yeah we're happy to be there yeah yeah I, I would definitely feel more comfortable if you were there so yeah okay um so i think i think that's it for me so adele happy to answer any questions or help you folks with outreach questions so um one question is for the for the six of us um assembled here how important is it that we uh, get people to opt up to a hundred percent we were divided in our small group um, on this topic and because we have all three communities here i would like to hear what people think You're saying you'd like to hear the some opinions, or, or are you asking Marlena in uh, something more spe specific? I'm asking you all for your opinions about right. how important it is to get people to opt up. Okay. Because, of course, uh, we have very different rates in those in the in the various communities. Yeah. Yeah. Adele, I'll I, say I, it's the second most important thing after getting the program launched. Really? Okay. okay. So this is this is interesting. So I, I have the opposite view, but Adele, you probably know that. Um, that you know, I, I don't think recs currently impact the market for new renewable capacity pretty much at all. Mm -hmm. And what I want is people getting the cheapest possible electricity, which is part of the grid, which is getting cleaner, so that heat pumps look more attractive to them. Right. Yeah, I was I was going to say probably something similar to Ben. We're about to launch our heat pump program. Um, we finally got it all all together. So, um, you know, uh, it'll be launching fairly soon. We just got our contract signed. So I would say that I I don't see that as like the most important thing. I feel like we want to give people the information, um, but I don't feel the necessary that it has to be like a really hard drive to get people to do that because I do think the the pricing is going to be an issue so I I would suspect that doing things like the heat pump program getting people on solar those are things that we're going to want to encourage more of what do you think Darcy um I think I would agree with Ben. Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, that makes uh, four of us, um, but there were people in the group who disagreed, um, particularly regarding Northampton, which has national grid, and therefore opting up to 100% is less of a stretch than it is in Amherst or Pelham. And um, how often can somebody opt up and then decide that eh, well, maybe they don't really want to opt up? And yeah, you know, how often can they go back and forth? So you can move around from one option to another every month if you want. There's no restriction there. Okay. The only restriction is if you opt out and you want to come back. Right. Not guaranteed the program price. Okay. All right. And um, uh, we don't have uh, somebody identified in Pelham um, to be the uh, on the outreach committee. So um, that's something for you to consider, Tom. And um, 
Okay. And then the other questions were about uh, National Grid. Oh. National Grid will be sending out the cards or, or the Eversource. Um, and so they, they know um, who has what service. And um, can, A, can we get a list of the addresses that they sent the cards to? And B, could we in any way identify who has a third party supplier and or, and or the Greenup program um, from them, from the uh, utility? So just a, a point of clarification, uh, the utilities are not doing the mailings. Um, your supplier does the mailing. So first point power it does the mailing. The utility oh, creates okay. the mailing list of basic service customers. The new DBU guidelines actually open the door for the first time in a long time for the utilities to provide information about who's on competitive supply contracts. They have Ooh. not done that. Um, however, to date, I don't believe we have requested that. I mean, these guidelines just came out like two weeks ago, so it's still really, really new. But um, apparently now the utilities are going to be required to provide a list of customers on third-party suppliers so that aggregation communities can try to communicate with them. Wow. Uh, but it's just still still unfolding. So I would say yes with an asterisk. Let, like Let's check back in a bit um, once we know a little bit more about how that will work and what what will, what exactly we'll be getting from them. But I, it, it, it's much more encouraging than it's been for many years. Great, that's uh, that's good news. Yeah, but Adele, actually your idea, I mean, basically we can kind of back our way into most of those addresses. I mean, not all of them, right? But basically if we have the list of what was mailed out from our city and then we have the assessor's database of addresses and we look for all the ones that aren't matches, we'll have a lot of dry, uh, dry holes, so, you know, so we'll miss some. And then we will send to some people or some addresses that aren't appropriate, but we could actually probably get a decent kind of remainder. <laughs> so that would be only owners of properties, correct? Correct. Yeah, In you, the assessor's you wouldn't be able to not, get not well, renters. You could it could go to the property. So if the the problem is, of course, if you have multiple addresses at a single property, that you'll miss some but you could do you know the old or current uh, occupant or whatever uh phrase. that's great that's good to know you can also okay. have um postings you know you can ask postings at rental properties you know usually there's like a general posting area oh. you could have the information you know like just a, like on a, on a okay. yeah like on a public board and yeah. a lot of times they'll have like some kind of mm -hmm. uh, central spot for that kind of thing. Hmm. So I know that like, I was just thinking about even in my, um, when my parents used to live in a condominium, even in their entryway, there was a board that, you know, they often listed notices like that had to do with the city or the community itself. So it might be good to have information up there. Hmm. So, um... I'm assuming from what you said, Marlana, that um, we will have access to the lists that First Light sends out to. Oh, the mailing list. Yeah, we can send you the mailing list. Um, That's great. So I, I, I just offer a lot of caution around the use of aggregation lists. And... Um, Probably I'll just want to double check with Paul on how he wants to phrase that caution. It's a big deal, right, to, for community members to hear from non-municipal staff who know something about their bill mm -hmm. or what choices they're making or something like that. And um, privacy is a really big deal with these lists. So yes, um, the data is all technically belongs to the communities, 
but I would just say, you know, you want to tread very carefully and be deliberate in how you choose to, how you choose to use it and who you choose to share it with. I think, well, I, I guess that raises the question, like, if are they, so technically, are they getting released to the municipalities? Or would they be released to this advocacy group? So, I mean, and no offense, Adele, I'm just trying to understand who the list belongs to. Like, if technically, belongs to the, so we have the list, right? We as the as the consultant for the municipalities, we receive the list on your behalf. We receive right. this information from the utilities, but it is your it is the municipalities' data, so we can give it to the municipalities. But I do this with a lot of caveats. It, so, no, it's a really good point because there are, like, there's op, op, uh, public records, right? You know, there's the, there's public public records and all that stuff, but there are also protections for privacy of individuals um, within that. Um, so th there there may actually be a reason to not just publish those addresses to anybody. Yeah, I was going to say, well, what I was going to recommend was that, you know, we will, cause I know that we'll want the mailing list as well, but we have an energy and climate action committee who's dying to do some work <laughs> and would love to get their hands on this kind of a list, but they're officially a committee of the town, right? So working, you know, working in that capacity, we could sort of find a way to, you know, to get the information available to, to like either that group to then work with another group Mm -hmm. But somehow, like, I, I think it's an important, it's important to sort of figure out how to work with that data in a more controlled way, not just, mm -hmm. you know, disseminating the information to everybody's groups. I think yeah. it needs to live with like a specific either staff, municipal employee and or committee. So I'm thinking like for Amherst, it would be me working with the ECAC and then tangentially working with other groups, so LEA, um, mm -hmm. and working that way um, so that it's ha like, so, because I feel like ultimately I would want to have some kind of responsibility for that data. I would be really, I wouldn't want just, even the ECAC, I wouldn't want them to just like take that data and run with it. I think it has to be worked with in a very controlled yeah. way. So Yeah. The DP and the DPU wants the data to be very carefully guarded. So there's, there's, and just so you go, no, there's, there's the basic service list, which is everybody on basic service, some of whom will opt out and not be enrolled. And those are used for mailings. But then once the program gets up and running, we're going to have reporting from the supplier on who's enrolled, how much electricity they use, what option they're enrolled in, all of that yeah. stuff, like a lot of detailed account data. We typically aggregate that and periodically we'll send reporting out to you with aggregate numbers. Some communities want to see a lot of details. Um, most don't just because of FOIA concerns. Um, but again, that's it's technically municipal data, but typically what we do is we'll, if, if you want information out of it, we can run reports on it, aggregate stuff. Um, if you want mailing lists based on this like program data, for example, um, we'll, we'll create mailing lists typically. Um, some communities have us create the mailing list and send it to them. Other communities will actually not even have us send the mailing list to them. We, we send the mailing list directly to a mail house and it bypasses the community. So the community is never in possession of a list of account holders in the program. Um, so it just depends kind of like on where you guys fall on your FOIA concerns. Paul kind of he feel, he's often said, well, he feels like an argument could be made that this information is exempt from FOIA, but not everybody feels that way. So um, yeah. just, you know, just some things to continue to think about. Um, and of course, you know, the DPU will have very strong opinions about needing to protect privacy too. Um, but technically the data does belong to the municipalities. The base, we can give, give you the basic service list. And as far as I know, um, and cause we, we receive the measure proxy and then this detailed reporting. And then we should be able to get the information about who's on competitive supply. But as I said, that's so new, it hasn't even happened yet. Don't, don't know the details around that yet. Okay. And how often would the um, utility refresh the basic service list, for example, um, 
if somebody goes off of their contract with an independent supplier, how long will it take for them to get on the utilities basic service list and therefore be offered a place in the aggregation? So, I mean, they wind up on basic service, the billing cycle that they leave their supplier. So it's just, okay. it's just like their status, right? Either they're getting billed through their supplier, or they're on basic service. So it's, you know, the billing cycle that happens is when they're on the basic service list. If you're asking kind of how does enrollment happen with customers who come off their supply contract, maybe that they're on now or at the program launch, or maybe people who move in to the communities after program launch, that happens on a periodic basis, about quarterly we will go to the utilities and ask them for the current basic service list. That basic service list will be a combination of new accounts that have moved in, people who've come off supply, and also accounts that opted out of the program previously. So we'll screen out anyone who's opted out previously because they should never, once you've opted out, you're out. So we do the screening, we create the mailing list, and then we oversee roughly quarterly mailings working with your supplier to continue to bring new accounts in. And that's the primary mechanism for enrolling new customers in the program and balancing the attrition of people moving out. That's great, thank you. And okay, it's the same, so the same opt-out notice goes out. We just continue to update it with new mailing dates, new basic service prices, all of that. Right. So um, with the, those of us who are remaining, I think it's really important for us to coordinate messaging and um, so, Ben, you're going to be on the radio tomorrow, and so we need to know what you're saying, and we'll, we'll need to get a transcript of, of that radio show, uh, et cetera. And um, I mean, Marlena, I, I don't know if they do transcripts. I, I mean, and it's not going to be the only thing discussed. Um, yeah. I think what I, what I'm going to say is in response to questions right and what then what show is it can you tell us uh um brian uh brian adams on whmp and what time uh his show is at 10 a.m okay which day tomorrow 10 a.m tomorrow okay. yeah and again he's he's asking all sorts of Northampton energy and sustainability questions. You know, it wasn't specifically about this. Yeah. Okay. And once Marlena uh, sends out the form for us all to record things in presentations in, mm -hmm. uh, we will want to um, share that widely um, so that mm -hmm. we know what's being said to whom so that we don't go to the same organization that you've already gone to. Right. For example. The one thing I would just ask everybody is remember your savings can't be guaranteed disclaimer. Right. Just right. remember not to promise savings. And that's not just because it's an important box for the DPU. It's yeah. really important for you guys to protect yourselves against the public coming back and saying you you sold us a bill of goods. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I was gonna even note that, I mean, even in the notice right now, where it mentions the price, you know, there is a sort of little disclaimer, but it's kind of small print. And I'm kind of feeling like that should actually be a bullet. I don't think it should just be a small disclaimer. I think it really should maybe be a bullet that is a more read readily readable for the person who gets this, because a lot of times I think people don't read this fine print. Mm -hmm. So that's just a suggestion. Um, mm -hmm. I, I sort of thought of that when we were reviewing it and I didn't say anything, but I'm really thinking more like, I think well, that's. Maybe we could bold it to make it a little more um, visually evident. I think one of the challenges has been, um, as you can imagine, space <laughs> is at a premium yeah. on these notices. It's actually a major challenge because we still have a lot of information we're trying to get in there. Um, but if you want us, I'm just looking at it now. I think making it a bullet may be possible. We could try it. I could try it as a bullet. Just, I mean, if you can, Marlena, I just, or bold it, just somehow making that more, like have that information jump out because it's been such a key point that we've been trying to convey to everybody. And then in the information, it shows up kind of small. So I kind of feel like if it's such an important point, we really want to make it 
stick out. And because I, I am concerned, you know, it is two years, you know, we've committed to this price for two years. Yeah. So, you know, in six months, if the price goes down and people are like, well, wait a minute, you know, you just said your price was below. I think we want to be clear. I don't know how many of you noticed when the mayor of East Hampton was quoted recently um, about their aggregation, their incipient aggregation. She said twice that um, that it was about saving money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, which is just, I mean, never mind uh, the regulators. Yeah, she, she, uh, she didn't get that memo. <laughs> right, but I mean, you just, yes, it's important. I think it's it's naive not to acknowledge the fact that people care about price and the program is providing savings at launch. And it's totally legitimate to, you know, broadcast that and make that right. point. You right. should. You just don't want to paint yourself into a corner. Right, exactly. Right. And I guess that's, that's my point. And it's not, you know, I just, again, I feel like we just want to be transparent right off the gate that it's not a guarantee of savings. It's just that right now, this is a savings and there are other benefits to doing this. And we, you know, we think consistently over time, it will save people. It'll average out or, you know, it's, it's the greener option, I guess, is really the messaging. Well, we and it's, I mean, it's providing price stability, which is a huge benefit based on the past few years, especially those in national grid territory where the, you know, everybody was hurt, but national grid customers really hurt. Um, that's not a, not a small thing. Like stability and predictability is a big deal. And then there's the sustainability component. Yeah. And I think for, well, certainly from our point, this group, I think we were really concerned about the sustainability aspect of what we're providing. So I think that's kind of the big piece that we really wanted to message. So, um, but anyway, I think we're good. I, I actually was supposed to be on another meeting at two, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, our, I just wanted to make sure, Adele, do you have any more questions? I don't want to- I think that's up. it. Um, I, I will uh, handle the others by email if, um, if there are any. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And thanks Marlena as always for all of the support and the information. And um, I'll look to getting those few um, articles from you and items from you, and then I'll send them out to the group. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Marlena. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank All right. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.